This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome in the fifth of the lectures that you've been involved with in terms of anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system. Tonight, we're going to look at blood vessels and the pathology that's associated with the intravascular highway. And it is an intravascular highway that's constantly on the move. No matter what you're doing, studying, whether you're sleeping, enjoying a movie, reading a book. And what is going on there and what can go wrong is quite amazing. And that's what I plan to present tonight and continue the story when we look at the pump itself in terms of what's going to happen to the pathology of the corazón, the heart, and how the cardiovascular system. My name is Dr. Henry Sanchez. I'm a professor of clinical pathology here at the University of California in San Francisco. From my biography, I graduated from Stanford, went to the Keck School of Medicine in Southern California, did part of my residency in internal medicine and then the rest in pathology. And I've been here on the faculty over 20 years harassing, stimulating, and training medical students, dental students, pharmacy students, physical therapy students, dental hygiene students, and PATH residents. Not your turn tonight, okay? What are the objectives that we're going to take part in this first series of these lectures? One. First, I've got to make sure that everybody understands what a pathologist is, because everybody has their different ideas. Some is myth and some is fact. We have to clarify that before we can go on to see what happens that goes wrong. And describe the role of the pathologist looking at every organ system, and tonight we're going to be looking at the cardiovascular system. So we're going to describe the cellular and tissue responses to increase stress, demand, and injury. And this is critical to understand that every cell in your body right now is under some type of demand or stress and are in times of injury. And what that each organ system does and the cells that make up the characters that set the stage for this is critical to understand and how we can control it, anticipate it, and prevent conditions that I will show you that can happen. The third thing is we're going to look at common conditions that we hear about that involve the peripheral part of the circulation, in other words, the conduits. In this case, we're going to look at the term edema, congestion, thrombosis, and embolism. Because it's not just the flow of blood, but the constituents that make it up are critical to understand. It's, it's a liquid that has cells, it has macromolecules, it has ions. And all of these interact with the intravascular space and the organs in which it has to go through and what happens when things go awry. And the last thing we're going to do is define and describe a common condition that occurs to our vessels as a function of time, which most people are told is called hardening of the arteries, or the clinical term is atherosclerosis. Does anybody know what MD stands for? No, it's not medical doctor. It means medical dictionary. Half the battle of healthcare is understanding the vocabulary, and as a pathologist, I've become an English teacher. Because we use these terms very precisely. As you're going to see, when we define things, it's important, and you'll see why definitions are critical. Because that will help define what we need to do and understand about the processes. Everyone thinks of the pathologist in this setting, and here we see it, fiction. 
CSI. How many people watch CSI? That's what I thought. Do you believe everything you see there? But why do you watch it then? For melodrama? Well, look at this. Let's use common sense. What do you notice about the ambiance in which we look at this setting? What's wrong with it? In the dark. Would you do an autopsy or surgery in the dark on a patient? And it's a forensic case and you're trying to find the cause of death? You would never be able to find it in the dark. <laughs> what do you notice about the solutions in the background? It will remind you of the china that you have in your, at home. Why would you do that? And look at all the different colored solutions. Form formalin is the only solution you have in the autopsy suite and it has no color to it. But here they're trying to give you this ambiance of being at home, <laughs> in the autopsy home. The other thing, what do you notice about the prosector here? It doesn't have a mask on or bonnet because when you do an autopsy, you use universal precautions. What does it actually look like? It looks like this. This is an actual autopsy that's performed and to show you the investigation. The autopsies you see in CSI are medical legal ramification because of murder, suicide or accidents. 93% of all deaths in the United States is due to natural causes. And the natural causes we're going to talk about tonight is a reflection of that in terms of the cardiovascular system. And we do wear masks and we use universal precautions. And we're trying to understand from the thorough understanding of the anatomy that you learned in the first two from Dr. Smoot and the physiology from Dr. Igor Metrovich. And I show you what happens when you tie all this information together. So what is the definition of pathology? I know as high school students and others that have learned biology, think the study of life, and basically pathology means the study of suffering, because that's how it all began. Because diseases cause suffering in patients, we want to alleviate that, but the modern definition of pathology is the study of all aspects of a disease process. It's like reading a good book. There's a beginning, middle, and end. Like life, like going through high school, going through college, going through medical school, and that story is going to be unfold. So tonight I'm going to be your storyteller and how you understand and apply the things you learn in chemistry, physics, biology, even as high school students, you'll see how these principles apply even now. And that's why you have to go through this process to get there. So pathology is a convergence of the basic sciences from anatomy, embryology, to histology, physiology, biochemistry, genetics, cell biology, immunology, microbiology, you name it, all the basic science, physics, chemistry, it's all wrapped up. And then the application is then applied to the clinical sciences, pediatrics, neurology, surgery, pathology. And so it becomes critical that as a pathologist, we, we have to understand from all these different areas and how to apply it to tell a good story so we can make the life better for others. We wouldn't be sitting in this room without the sacrifice of previous generations. And our generosity will also help the next future generations that have not even been born yet. So it's the study of structure and function, and that's the key word. So when you're learning your biology, the structure evolved to this point because of a reason. There was selective advantage and understanding. Same thing is true of the human body and what happens and how it has to deal with stress, increased demand or injury and how it's evolved over millions of years and the function because the way they look under the microscope, the way their shape you see in gross anatomy, there's a reason for it and then when it becomes altered, it becomes understandable why it has occurred in that way. So basically, pathology is the foundation of modern medicine because with understanding all these principles of science and the clinical sciences together, it helps provide an understanding of what's going on. So what's the role of the pathologist? One, we study diseases. Everything that can occur at the time of conception to the time you're 120. That's the maximum lifespan of a human being at this point. People are trying to get live longer. I don't know if you want to make, pay more taxes. That's the end result. But we have to worry about the things that occur. So basically, it's a very descriptive science. Medicine is very descriptive. You want to describe things in a very accurate way so that when people hear the description or they see it, 
they can make the diagnosis of what is going on. And that's what I'm going to show you with the various conditions that involve the cardiovascular system tonight. We also want to set up experimental models or studies to deal with this. We get down now, we have a branch, like in every other area of medicine, is molecular pathology. Now going down to the nucleic acids, to the genes, and seeing how important it is to explain diseases that were generations ago not explainable, but now today they're getting evidence and revelation and understanding, and what we can do about it. Pathologist also is important to make the diagnosis. Who has been your guardian angel all your life? has been a pathologist. Since the time you were in your mother's womb, she went to see a physician, blood was drawn. Who were they sent to? Pathologist. When you pee and you send it to the, the doctor gets your pee, who do you think you send it to? Pathologist. When you get a breast biopsy, pap test, or the cervix, who do you send it to? Pathologist. When you have an operation, and they want to know whether they're going to, it's cancer or it's an inflammatory process, who do you send it to? Pathologists. Because based on what we describe to the clinician, that clinician who's treating you will decide what to do next. So we're like English teachers, we're very stringent in how we describe things and what the conclusion we can make to make sure that you'll be fine and life will continue the way it did before you had that illness. So it's the clinical discipline of pathology when you make these diagnoses or findings that are given to the primary care physician. And there is branches of pathology, like every part of medicine is broken into subdividing. It's like breaking up a pie. So the pie of pathology is broken into two big halves. One is anatomic pathologist, that you call the surgical pathologist who gets tissue. It actually looks at tissue and looks at the architecture that's been altered and whether it's normal or not normal and then decide what do you want to call it. The cytopathologist is looking at individual cells, that those you take the scraping off the cervix of a woman and you want to know whether there is human papillomavirus infecting the squamous cells and worrying about it's gone, going to go on to cancer. Then you have the autopsy pathologist and that's me. I'm the ultimate biopsy because I get the chance to look at all the tissues and then tell the story. Well, there are the others get pieces of the puzzle. And based on the clinical history and the findings that are given by the physicians that are treating the patient, and we work on that as well. And then the final half is the clinical pathologist. That's for blood banking, chemistry, looking at your blood, what's your ions, your liver function tests, microbiology, immunopathology, where you're looking at for leukemias, malignancies that cancers arise in the bone marrow, and those that arise in lymph nodes or lymphomas. So you want to know what is going on. So it's hemopoietic pathology. So an overview of pathology, what are we interested in? The cause or etiology? Why is that important to know, by the way? What's the most important re knowing that? One word. That's exactly right. Because if you understand what causes of disease, then you can set in healthcare policy to stop it. What is the leading cause of lung cancer in the world? Smoking. Wouldn't it be nice to wake up in the tomorrow morning and have there be no one be smoking ever again? You know how many lives would be saved with that wish to be fulfilled? But unfortunately, there's economic issues that drive diseases or allow them to curve. This is a very important term, and that's what I'm going to share with you tonight, looking at the cardiovascular system, is the term pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is the story. As the storyteller, we'll put these facts that we learn from anatomy and physiology and biochemistry and immunology to understand what is going on and to tell why it occurred and why we didn't realize it's occurring and understand the beginning, middle, and end. And the etiology and cause is the trigger of the story that elicits this process. What's going to be a reflection of the pathogenesis are the changes we can see, we can measure. So when a patient comes in or is at home complaining about something, we call those the symptoms. What the physician or, or the medical caregiver that elicits, like taking a temperature, taking a blood pressure, listening to the chest, that is what is called the signs that the physician is correlating with the symptoms. And so you do a chest x-ray, you do a CT scan to see what is going on that helps explain 
the symptoms and signs and tried to do the appropriate tests and get arrive at a diagnosis and then help the patient. And obviously, when we look at changes that occur, they're gonna be functional changes. Is it the mental state of the person? They're becoming depressed, why? What's eliciting this? Is it because of a drug? Is it psychiatric? What's going on? They're having chest pain. Is it esophageal spasm? Is it having a heart attack? Or they're having an embolus going through their lungs and causing chest pain. Or maybe they have pneumonia causing pain that's irritating the surface of the chest from the lung. That's just one example. So this is very important. This is the essence of medicine on this one slide. Can you believe it? But it comes down to this, that every cell that you learn in anatomy, histology, in every tissue is living in a homeostatic state. And this homeostatic state is very critical. And it constantly has to go through physiologic and biochemical changes, and it's in interacting as a complex ecosystem with every other organ system in the body. Your skin interacts with your nervous system, your musculature, your bones, your GI tract, your heart, your lungs. This complex ecosystem is interrelated and they're constantly communicating with one another and you don't even have to worry about it. But it's done when you're asleep. And when these become altered, then we have problems. So what does the cell or tissue do? Like you, like every other living organism, it tries to do what? To adapt to the new stress or demand. You remove your finger away from the fire, otherwise you know what's gonna happen. You stay up late at night, you know what's gonna happen during the middle of the exam, you'll fall asleep and we're gonna have dire consequences. So you try to avoid the situation because there is going to be something you'll have to pay. If you can't adapt, then the cells or the tissues are gonna go through a process of cell injury. And at this accumulation, it, you may not feel the cell injury until it accumulates to a certain point that now the symptoms and signs will now evolve as a function of time. And basically, it can come down to what we call reversible injury. If you take away the insult, you can now avoid the inevitable. If it's not taken, it's irreversible. What's the problem? The cells that have irreversible cell damage is death. Death is irreversible. And we have different names for this. When tissue die, we call this necrosis, a condition of dead tissue surrounded by living tissue. There are cells that die because it's built in. All our cells have the capacity to go through what is called programmed cell death without an inflammatory response, and it's called apoptosis. Apoptosis means to take off. In this case, the cells die, and they can be triggered by a variety of different stimuli. So we're really talking about life itself. You either adapt or you die. And so when you talk about diseases, this is exactly what's happening to ourselves and the ability to deal with it becomes very critical in how, we, how each organ system and cell and tissue try to compensate for this. So this is a quick overview of pathology. I've got to get you into this mode of thinking before we get to the cardiovascular system. So when we think of the cardiovascular system, what is critical variables that sets the stage if these variables are altered? What will the cardiovascular system do? One, it's got a perfused tissue because all eukaryotic cells require what? Oxygen and nutrients and get rid of waste products. So one thing that's very critical is the pressure. It's a pressurized system that's critical. And you learned about this in the physiology. Which side has the higher pressure? The arterial side or the venous side? arterial and you need to keep that pressure going to the tissues because if they don't get enough pressure perfusion is decreased and you can lead to what we call ischemic injury or hypoxic damage the most common cause of cell injury in your human body is the lack of oxygen and there are many conditions that you see especially when it involves the cardiovascular system is a common end result is hypoxic injury so pressure is very important you learn about the mean arterial pressure from Igor Another important variable is volume. Which part of the cardiovascular system has the greater volume? The arterial side or the venous side? Venus. The venous, exactly, see? It's like building a house. You start from the foundation and you move forward. The next variable is contractility. There's contractility you learn in the heart and there's contractility in your arterials and muscular arteries that provide the ability to maintain total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance 
to maintain good perfusion to avoid injury to the tissue. And the last is another C word, is compliance. Compliance is the stiffness. You can, in very simplistic terms, which part of the cardiovascular system is stiffer, arteries or veins? Arteries, because they have more layers to them, so they have least compliance. And that becomes important to maintain pressure and allow blood to get to the tissue. Versus the venous side, you want to be able to provide a reservoir of blood to get it to the heart, that when you need it, you can pump it out and go through the lungs and deliver it to your tissue. So it becomes important to realize these factors. If you understand these variables, then you can dissect through different processes that we're going to talk about or share with you tonight that we talked about in the beginning. So it's pressure, volume, contractility, and compliance. So let's begin. When we talk about the cardiovascular system, we often have to think of it in a very systematic approach. We've gone through some of the variables that were important. We're going to apply it, starting from the aorta, which is the largest artery in the body. And it has the least compliant, and it's where the highest pressure. As you go down to the ar arteries, which are muscular arteries, and make the transition to arterioles within the vascular bed of tissue, then you're going to get to the capillary. What's going to happen to pressure as you go down this cascade of vessels? Why does it get reduced? Use physics to answer the question from high school. From physics, remember, pressure is a force, isn't it? And it's kinetic energy. What happens kinetic energy as you go down the conduits? It gets dispersed through the walls, and then you get down to the lowest pressure once that kinetic energy has been released through the vasculature. So physics is good stuff. Don't forget it. It applies. You're going to break it down to this, OK? The capillaries. The capillaries are very important because that's where gas exchange waste products. But what else gets through the walls? besides nutrients are cells. But where do cells leave the intravascular space is the postcapillary venule. And I'm going to show you next Wednesday, and I'll show you with a movie, how cells get out of the intravascular space to fight off infections, to fight off cancer, and also cause problems, too, like autoimmune diseases where you attack yourself. So it's not only molecules that can go through this cardiovascular highway, but cells have to leave it at the appropriate time in various conditions. And we'll see how it applies to the cardiovascular system. And then the venule and the veins. Most of the diseases, where do you think usually occurs on what side, the arterial side or the venous side? If you had to take a guess based on what we've just talked about. Why do you think it's the arteries rather than the veins? Pressure, that's exactly right. High pressure systems are more likely to go out, and we found that out in San Bruno about two years ago. That's a classic example where the pressure would cause the problem, and there was a weakness in the wall. The same thing is true when you have weakness in the cardiovascular system. What are the devastating effects that can occur? So it's pressure, and that's where the, the brunt of the damage occurs is going to be occurring in the arterial side. See, you're a pathologist already. You're getting in the mood for the evening. You're ready to go. So here's a diagram. And this is a diagram to show you that when you have the arterial side going in, that there's hydrostatic pressure. And that hydrostatic pressure is pressing against the wall in the capillary bed, and it's a semi-permeable membrane. And it's very specific what gets out. Small molecules and ions. Ions, you think of chloride, potassium. Sodium. Wherever sodium goes, what always follows sodium in a solution? This is a chemistry question now. Wherever sodium goes, what wants to go with it? Water, exactly. Since 75% of the body is made of water, so wherever sodium goes in, water will follow. But then some of the water has got to be brought back in, because what's going to happen to the intravascular volume? It'll be decreased. But we have what are called molecules or proteins that act as an oncotic pressure. 
And the oncotic pressure, or the pressure in your capillaries is roughly 28 millimeters of mercury. 22 millimeters of mercury is due to albumin. Albumin is the most common protein found in your serum and it's made by your hepatocytes in the liver. And we're going to talk about what happens when you can't make that protein and what's going to happen to this fluid. And so what happens is it draws the fluid back, but it can't get all the fluid back to get through the venous system. Now you have to have the lymphatics. And the lymphatics will provide the rest of the fluid to be drained through the thoracic duct and into the left subclavian vein and enter your venous system. But there's one organ that does not have lymphatics. What organ is that? You're using it right now to figure out the answer. Ah, a little hint there. It is the CNS. The central nervous system does not have lymphatics because this becomes very important in medicine because what if you had inflammation? You get swelling. If you have trauma, it's in a hard shell and it's like the consistency of a bowl of jelly. It, has, it will now cause the brain to go downward and herniate and then it'll cause neuro neurologic compromise and you can die from that. So that becomes a real problem when there's fluid accumulating in the brain because there's no lymphatics. So knowing the anatomy and knowing these facts become critical to understand structure and function and when conditions alter these organs or tissues, what do we do next? So we're going to talk about edema, fluid and tissue. We're going to talk about congestion. What does this mean to tissues? We're going to talk about how blood is not allowed to leave. So we call the process hemostasis, and there are many conditions that can inhibit this process. And we're also going to talk about thrombus, intravascular coagulation that takes place when you're alive. And then if it travels to a distant site, we call it an embolus. And we're going to compare and contrast a thrombus and an embolus between a blood clot because a lot of people use this interchangeably and I'll show you the difference. You'll see why we're a purist as pathologists and how we look at this. And the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. And I brought some specimens to illustrate this. Seeing is believing. That's why I like pathology. I'm a touchy, feely type of person as my family will tell you. <laughs> and I'm a very visual person so I like to see things. And smell it too, because it's also important. All your senses are important as a clinician. So let's talk about edema. What is it? It's defined as fluid that's occurring in the interstitial space. So now if, the, if tissues acquire fluid, water, what's going to happen to its weight? It's going to go up. If it's the heart, or if it's the lungs, or if it's your brain, if those organs swell, what happens to its compliance? The compliance becomes less of so the function of the lung. You're going to cause problems in the lung, pulmonary edema. You will now be drowning your own fluid. Gas exchange won't take place. The heart contractility will be affected. The body to move. If you had edema throughout the body, it would be a real problem. So what's a cause? It could be damage to the vessel wall to make it leaky. What's a common thing that everyone in this room has experienced? Is inflammation. How many people have bumped themselves? sprain their ankle. What happens to your ankle? It blows up. What did you have? Edema. And what did you do? Why do they always tell you to elevate it? And they elevate it above your heart so it allows gravity. So you're providing hydrostatic change and shift. What's another cause? The way, easy way to remember is because you have five fingers on your hand. That's the causes of edema. We're going to go through all five. So I always tell students, you bring your hand to the exam, just count them on your fingers. Just have to remember how it all works. So the first one is damage to the vessel wall, inflammation, you get vasodilatation, increased capillary leakness, leakness, increased hydrostatic pressure. How many people have ever stood on their feet all day long with brand new shoes? And how did your feet feel after that? Not good. And that is because standing on your feet all day is the hydrostatic pressure because of that is going to cause the venous system to the most compliant is going to allow it to get leaky and therefore your feet swell. Therefore, knowing this, when's the best time to get shoes, buy new shoes, in the morning or the evening? That's right. 
it. Because if you buy them when they're smallest, you'll pay for it in the evening eventually. So take your children or yourself, unless you want to go back to the shoe store, do it in the evening when you've been standing up. That'll be the maximum size your feet will get. So when you get home, you lift your feet up, you bring the fluid back in and decrease this process. The third thing is what ion, if there's too much in the tissue, what will follow it? Sodium and water. So when you have too much edema in tissue, what does the doctor tell you? Decrease salty foods. So you decrease the amount of sodium, therefore you'll decrease the amount of fluid that can accumulate in the tissue. Next is decrease colloidal oncotic pressure, because you have molecules that can't go, proteins that are large molecules that can't, that are in the intravascular space, it's going to draw the fluid back into it. And that's what becomes important. Where is albumin made, as I mentioned, is in the liver. What's a chronic disease that destroys the liver is cirrhosis. In this country, the most common cause is alcohol. Now, the, what's the function of the uropatocytes? They synthesize many molecules that's important for your body, and they also, do, it's a detoxification organ. So now you can't make albumin. What happens? You blow up, and we call this edema all over your body, anasarca. If you ever want to invite me to play Scrabble on the internet, I got a lot of words to share with you. <laughs> That's one, anasarca. The next is lymphatic obstruction. For example, if you have a woman who has a radical mastectomy, where they take the breast and the pectoris muscle off the chest, you often destroy the axillary lymphatics that drain the upper extremity. You'll notice sometimes a woman may have their arm larger than the other side. And because they can't drain the lymphatics, it builds up and they get lymphedema in that arm because of the destruction to the lymphatics. There are infectious diseases that can go through the lymphatics. Tumors that can go through lymphatics and cause obstruction and cause changes in that site. And one of the most common things that's emerging that's causing lymphatic obstruction is obesity. Because obesity in lower extremities will collapse the lymphatics and you get chronic lymphedema and you'll get elephantitis. And you can look this up on the internet. Go to Google Images, it's just a click away, and just put elephantitis and obesity and see what you get. So those are the five. Problems with the vessel wall, problems with hydratic increase, hydrostatic pressure, problems with too much sodium in the interstitium around the blood vessels or in the tissue, decreased colloidal pressure, or problems with the lymphatics. So this is a diagram to illustrate this. Here we see one, increased permeability. So you get more water, sodium going in there, increased hydrostatic pressure, pushing pressure against the wall, fluid go out, will go out. Then if you have decrease on albumin, you have decreased colloidal oncotic pressure, so the fluid stays here rather than coming into the intravascular space. And then if you have problems with lymphatics, or in the case of the brain, there is no lymphatics, we give a problem. So what do you think patients are treated with if they have head trauma or some type of infection? They'll give a colloid, mannitol. And mannitol doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, and it helps bring the fluid from the brain. So you can actually introduce molecule or colloid into the intravascular space to deal with edema in places like the brain because it doesn't have lymphatics and help it. So there's all sorts of things, but it's based on these principles. So edema is localized with acute inflammation, sprain, having an ankle sprain, for example, or a carrier, hives. How many people have hives and they get all of a sudden it swells up, a bee sting? That's because of the release of histamine causing increased vasodilation and venous thrombosis clotting of the blood in the venous side, the pressure backs up into the capillaries and you get edema. Or if your heart fails on the left side, where's the blood going to back up into what organ? The lungs. the lungs. And the increased hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries will lead to what? Edema. Now the lungs can't function and the patient will complain of what? Shortness of breath. Dyspnea. Then this is a great word, I love this term. When there's edema all through your body, we call anasarca. It just sounds when you say it. So what's gonna cause it? Well, what's the critical that makes the blood go around is the heart. So anything that causes damage to the heart, we'll see next week, can lead to congestive heart failure. So you're gonna lead to swelling. If it's both sides of the heart, it'll affect the venous side on the right side, and then obviously the left side fails, it's gonna affect the pulmonary vasculature. 
So anatomy becomes very important. If we destroy the liver, like in cirrhosis, can't make albumin, you're going to get edema everywhere. Kidney. You say, how does a kidney apply to this? Remember the kidney, it filters the blood. 10 to 15 percent of your cardiac output goes to your kidney, and if there is the glomeruli that filters the blood, gets leaky, what can leak out into the urine? A lot of protein. And when you lose that protein in a condition called nephrotic syndrome, you basically, you can lead to anasarca. Does anybody know what the term syndrome means? What's the difference between a disease and a syndrome? Collection of symptoms. They both have a collection of symptoms and signs, but what distinguishes a disease from a syndrome? Getting close. Generalize? So what does MD stand for? Medical dictionary. It's, what book do you think I caressed for the first two years of medical school? A medical dictionary. And it paid off handsomely. And so what is a disease? It's a unique process that leads to an abnormality due to a unique collection of symptoms and signs. It has a unique etiology. A syndrome means that you have multiple causes, but you have the same clinical presentation that's unique to it. There's a disease called Cushing's disease where you have a pituitary adenoma, a benign tumor pituitary that secretes adrenal cortical tropic hormone that causes your adrenal glands to make more hormones. But you have Cushing's syndrome means that you can have a tumor in the liver, in the lung, or in the kidney that makes ACTH, or you take pregnisone. People who take pregnisone can get Cushing syndrome, so exogenous sources. So it's important to know these definitions. And oh, here's a good one. Does anybody know what iatrogenic means? It's due to the doctor's fault that causes the problem. See, we're special too, just like everybody else. We could be a cause of the disease ourselves. So we call it iatrogenic. Because one of the things when a people come into an emergency room and they have decreased pressure, what do you think they give them to maintain pressure is fluids. So if you over fluid resuscitate them, you can lead to edema as well. And so we can be the cause. So this looks like a complex diagram to look at anasarca, but it really isn't when you think about those variables we talked about. What is the, if the heart fails, like we'll talk about next week, what happens to your cardiac output? It drops. So what is the body going to do? It has two choices. What is it going to do? Adapt or die. die. We're going to adapt first. Much easier because we know that's reversible. So we have decreased effective arterial blood volume. So what does the kidney release? Renin. Because it helps control blood pressure releasing this molecule that will then go through a process of increasing peripheral vascular resistance. So your resistance or compliance is decreased. The compliance decreased, resistance goes up. So the pressure, aldosterone, retains sodium. So if you retain sodium, what falls sodium everywhere? <gasps> ah, so what happens to the intravascular volume? It goes up. And so you re the kidney will now take up more sodium to get it back into the intravascular space. With the water, you increase the plasma volume. But what happens is the leakiness is such that you get edema. So if you have renal failure, can't do that, it becomes a problem because you retain sodium. The central venous pressure will increase because the heart's not pumping. The capillary pressure, because it's backing up, it's going to go increase. You get edema. Now up here you have malnutrition. You ever seen children in parts of the world where you notice they have an abdomen? You ever wondered what's going on there, why they have that? It's edema, or, and what the problem is, they don't have protein in their diet. Because protein is made of amino acids, and what does the liver make? Albumin, which is a protein. So if you don't have the amino acids, you don't have the albumin, and therefore you get increased leakiness, and you get fluid in the belly, in the peritoneal cavity. So it tells you right away, you can make the diagnosis, this is a problem in their diet they're missing, is protein. So it's a protein deficiency is, what is a consequence of this, okay? This is what edema looks like clinically. This is called pitting edema. What the physician will do is to map the fluid. You notice these two imprints right here? Those are my two fingers. 
Normally, if you press against your foot, there should be nothing there once I release it. And so you can actually map in the whole human body where the fluid is by pressing your finger to see if you leave your impression behind. And this is what is called pitting edema. So you can actually map for the camera. You can actually have going clinically and press and you can figure out just like figuring out where the level of the fluid in a barrel is. You can basically press on it and you can find how much edema. Another way of doing it is also weigh the patient because you're trying to get rid of the fluid you want to weigh them every day to get rid of that fluid, whatever's causing it. So this is called pitting edema. Another important concept is congestion. And congestion means dilated blood vessels. There's good congestion and there's bad congestion. We have different names for it. So there's passive congestion. This means there's some kind of mechanical process that's interfering with blood getting to the site. Something is impeding its flow. Like, for example, congestive heart failure. The pump is not working or you have vasodilation where the blood vessels dilate and blood is not allowed to go through like a thrombus causing it to obstruct the flow. Then we have a term called active congestion or another clinical term is hyperemia where the blood vessels are dilating because of chemicals being released around the blood vessels like histamine, bradykinin, prostaglandins that will then cause the blood vessels to dilate and when you have an allergic reaction, that's what's occurring because you increase the mast cells and then you get vasodilation. Now, which one do you think is the worst to have based on these descriptions that I've told you? Because the problem with the cardiovascular system is we don't want cells to become hypoxic or the lack of oxygen. So which one do you think would be worse to have? Mechanical problem leading to the dilated blood vessels or active? Well, the next slide in your handout will reveal the issue. We go back to that diagram. You have an ar arterial capillary bed and venous. So you have the red means it's oxygenated and the venous blood obviously decreased oxygen, not completely. When you have increased blood flow because of vasodilation, like an in inflammation, what do you notice about the oxygen content in the capillaries? That's good because when you're kind of fighting off an inflammatory process, you want to get oxygen nutrients to fight the battle. But what do you notice about passive congestion? What do you notice as the blood dilates and backs up? What happens to the oxygen content as a function of time? It drops. Because of that drop, the cells are going to have to die or adapt in response to it. So what's an example of this? Here's a normal liver. Your liver is brown because what two metals are found in it is iron and copper. The predominant metal is iron. That's why meat is its color. How many people have seen a nutmeg? For those that, how many people have gone to the cocina or kitchen? So how many colors do you see there in a nutmeg? One light, one dark. You see the dark and the light? Here's the dark and the light. One of the things that's unique about pathologists, we always describe diseases according to foods because everyone has to eat and so it's a universal language. No matter what country you come from, there are things that we can compare to. So what can happen in the liver is called a nutmeg liver. And we can see this grossly. This is at autopsy. To give you orientation, this is the back of the liver because the liver drains the hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava and goes to your heart. And here you notice there's two colors, a dark color and a light color. So why is this occurring? Well, we have to go and look at the histology first. So the histology of the liver is called the liver lobular unit. This is one small cut of the pie. In the center of the lobular unit, we have the terminal hepatic vein that's going to drain it to the bigger hepatic veins and then go to the inferior vena cava. To go through the liver, we have a hepatic artery coming off the celiac trunk that's from your abdominal aorta. We have a bile duct, it's going to take bile that's conjugated and go to your gallbladder. And then the portal vein is from your intestine and your spleen because it makes sense the first organ that sees what you eat in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening is your liver because everything gets absorbed and it goes into the liver to be processed. So if the blood is backing up from the right side of the heart in the inferior vena cava, what's going to happen to the pressure in here? It's going to increase, 
So what's going to happen? You get passive congestion. What's going to happen to the oxygen content? As a function of time, it's going to go down because of the passive congestion. So what's going to happen is all that blood backs up in this area. There's the dark color and this is the light color. When you look at it histologically, here is the central vein. What do you notice? The blood is backing up and here's the portal triad. Portal vein, hepatic artery, and as well as the bile duct. And these are surrounding it. So these hepatocytes eventually will have less oxygen as a function of time. So when people are in congestive heart failure, when the heart allows this blood to back up in the tissues, what's chronically happening to all the cells? They're faced with chronic hypoxic damage. In the case of the liver, it will become scarred down if it's not controlled. So somebody who's in congestive heart failure can't be in that state for very long because you're going to lead to backing up the blood, lead to edema, decrease oxygenation of the tissue. So people who are in congestive heart failure have to be treated and find out what's the underlying cause. Okay. Hemostasis. How many people have cut themselves? Or I'll reverse the question. How many people have never cut themselves? <laughs> That's what I thought. Everybody's had experience with this. So what's going on? Because this becomes important when we talk about thrombus and embolism. So it's a sequence of events that's basically leading up to cessation of putting a plug, a hemostatic plug, that occurs fairly quickly, right? You cut yourself, paper cut, okay, or epitaxis or a bloody nose. It stops after a while. It's made of fibrin, platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. So when you think of problem of hemostasis, there's three components. The vessel wall, and what cells line your vessel wall are endothelial cells. And they're a very important cell that lines the entire intravascular volume. The second component are platelets. These are pieces of cytoplasm that are taken from what are called big cells, megakaryocytes, in the bone marrow that help with this whole process. How many ever built a wall, a brick wall? Well, that's what a hemostatic plug is, a building a brick wall in the intervascular space. And I'll show you the mortar and the bricks in a moment. The third component is the coagulation cascade. These are unique molecules that are manufactured primarily by the hepatocytes that are critical to provide a polymerization reaction. Here's the chemistry part, where you can take a monomer and convert it into a polymer in, a, in an important mesh, meshwork that provides hemostatic plug. So this has, where's the problem in hemostasis? Here's the dilemma. Let's say you poke a hole or you have damage to a blood vessel anywhere along the intravascular space. If we don't plug up the hole, what's going to happen in the intravascular volume? We lose it, pressure goes down, we have a problem. If we plug up the hole too big, too much, what happens to blood flow to the end of that tissue? It's decreased and that tissue will die. So now it has to be controlled in a very precise way and there are multiple mechanisms involved that control to make sure that you don't make the, you, you can make the plug to stop the bleeding but not make the plug too big. Because if that plug gets too big, we've got a problem locally. So you can see, this is not to be memorized, you won't be tested on this, but it's to show you that there are things that are going to form a hemostatic plug and if you look at this diagram, the first thing that will set it off is that you got to remember we're in a highway. You've been on 280, 101. Is it easy to get off those highways? No. In order to do that, you have to put on your signal and you hope that other people will look at it and they're mindful of what's going on and then you got to apply your brakes. Well, the same thing occurs in your intravascular space. What are the brakes? Well, underneath the endothelial cell is a basement membrane that contains collagen type 4. Most of your body is made of collagen type 1, 90%, like your skin, bone, and tendons. But this type 4 is found in your basement membranes. What happens is there's a molecule made by platelets as well as endothelial cells called von Willebrand's factor, these little green boxes that allows the platelets to bind to the collagen so it stops where the damage is. <coughs> More platelets come in and will bind to one another. And then see that blue? That represents the mortar. And that mortar is going to stabilize it because remember it's being hit by red blood cells and other constituents because it's still flowing the blood and it's got to stop that. And then you've got on this side that's going to promote to, to inhibit it because you don't want it to get too big. And there are things you have 
various things like prostaglandin with I, PGI2 that's it causes vasodilation and inhibits the platelets from touching one another. Or nitric oxide made by endothelial cells that will then cause the platelets not to stick with one another. For every step in this diagram, there's a disease. For example, there are people that have a disease called von Wurtelbrand's disease where they have a deficiency or a defect in this anchoring molecule and now they have increased problems with bleeding with minor trauma. But what happens if you can't inhibit it? Like for example, if you can't make PGI2 and you have another one that's called thromboxane, thromboxane will promote, you can get a thrombus and now cause infarcts. And infarcts is localized area of dead tissue because of the lack of blood flow is called an infarct in that area. So you can see it's tightly controlled. Which one do you see is more tightly controlled? Inhibition or favoring the clotting of blood? Just looking at the diagram, where is it more tightly controlled? On the, on the left or the right? The right, and that makes sense. Because you want to control that so you don't interfere with blood flow to that tissue, otherwise that tissue is going to die at the end of that distribution of that vessel. So it becomes very important. So the second component is platelets. They're circulating, you have about 150 to uh, 400,000 per millimeter cube. And that's a very small amount of volume and a lot of platelets. They're derived from the megakaryocytes from the bone marrow. What's the condition where you have decreased platelets? The quantity that can interfere with this is called thrombocytopenia. Penia means less of. Cyto, in this case, the thrombocytes. And there are two big problems. If you have destruction to the bone marrow because of drugs, viruses, or radiation, that can lead to it or if you have cancer going to the bone and replaces it. Or the platelets are consumed or destroyed outside the bone marrow. And there are conditions that can lead to that and we have a problem of bleeding as a consequence. You can see here on the bl blood vessel wall that here are the endothelial cells. Here's the von Willebrand's factor that binds the platelet. There are molecules or glycoproteins. And guess what? The fibrinogen is also on the surface, the monomer that's going to become fibrin and it has to be on the surface. Remember, this is a very static image because blood is flowing. So these molecules have to become in close proximity in order for enzymatic activity to take place to make this polymerization take place. So the monomer is bound to, on the platelets and then this will become the mortar or fibrin. So hemostasis, the next is coagulation, the mortar. It's an intravascular transformation or gel. It's a polymerization reaction that takes place and it'll trap the constituents like red blood cells and white blood cells. So coagulation, there's two pathways. There's the intrinsic, all the clotting factors that are responsible for this is in the blood right now. If I take out your blood and put it on the table, what will happen to it? It'll clot without any problem. The reason is there's an important clotting factor which is called Hagman factor. And Hagman factor was named after a patient who had a deficiency in this protein many decades ago. That's why it's called Hagman factor or factor 12. What it's looking for is a surface or substrate like plastic, cloth, anything that will bind to. So we can set off the, this chemical reactions, which I'll show you. Even a complex is glass. That's why if you take blood and put it in a tube of glass, it clots right away. So the factor is Hagman factor or factor 12. Then there's the extrinsic arm. This, what's going to trigger the, when you want it, is when you have injury to cells. Because there's a factor released from endothelial cells when you damage blood vessels called tissue factor. And this will stimulate the, this coagulation cascade as well. And it will activate through the process of factor 7. What does it look like? This looks like a chemistry diagram. And these are serine proteases that use calcium. So here's the intrinsic pathway where you want that Hagman factor to be exposed to collagen, the intravascular space to cause this process to take place and it goes through other clotting factors that become activated. The extrinsic, you need tissue injury, allow this process to occur and then we use calcium. And the yellow represents a plasma membrane, in this case the phospholipid membrane of the platelets because that's where this 
polymerization reaction that's taking place on the surface. And then what happens is there's a molecule called thrombin that converts the fibrinogen to the polymer fibrin. And to make it stronger, there's factor 13 that now makes it cross-linking between the proteins to help stabilize this hemostatic plug and to give stability and plug up the hole and then allow it to be reabsorbed and taken care of. And you don't even have to think about this. So what's the condition that will destroy this process is cirrhosis of the liver. Because what makes these clotting factors all the time is your liver. So somebody who has cirrhosis can't clot their blood and they can bleed very easily. One of the leading causes of death in cirrhotic patients is because the liver is changed morphologically where blood can't travel. The venous blood backs up into the esophagus and you get esophageal varices, the varicose veins, and they rupture and they bleed into their gastrointestinal tract because they have no more clotting factors. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's tell a story. I'm very visual. You can go through a list and see. We're going to see what happens when next time you cut yourself or injure yourself, think of what's occurring at the cellular level. And you don't even have to think about it. It does it automatically. So here you have injury to the endothelial cells in a blood vessel. You're going to cause a Constriction initially, there are various molecules will be released. The endothelial cells will release molecules like thromboxane, a prostaglandin that comes from the plasma membrane of cells, cause vasoconstriction. What does vasoconstriction do to blood flow? If you constrict it, what happens to flow? Decreases. So it now allows the exposed molecules of collagen for the von Willebrand's factor to bind to it. And what do you notice? The red is the von Willebrand's factor, and what's laying there are the bricks, in this case the platelets, and then, but that's not going to stabilize it because blood is flowing through this, and so what's the third component, the vessel wall, the platelets, and what do you see between the platelets is the polymerization reaction. Now you have a stabilized hemostatic plug, so it's now going to allow, this will be broken down eventually, and then the endothelial cells will now regenerate, and they're also circulating from the bone marrow. You reconstitute your blood vessel and everything is fine. So what happens is we can't let out to get it too big, so there are things that are released from the endothelial cells called tissue plasminogen activator that will break down this because it won't, it'll allow blood to flow through to the rest of the tissue and not cause ischemic injury. So this is tightly controlled. So there are diseases that can alter these processes, okay? What does it look like on a scanning electron micrograph? Here you see red blood cells, here's a platelet, and here are the fibrin strands. So now let's talk about thromboembolism, or thrombosis. Now we know a little bit about hemostasis. Why do we get thrombus? And what is a thrombus? Thrombus is coagulation of the blood when you're alive in the intravascular space. It can occur in your heart, in the chambers of your heart or any of your blood vessels, the arteries or the veins. Where do you think most likely it would occur? In the arteries or the veins? Do you think clotting of your blood when you're alive? Veins. The veins. Because it's 30 times the compliance of that, of the arterial side, that's where you get thrombosis. And this becomes important clinically. So what are the three factors? And this was first described by Verkau, who's the father of pathology, who's an Australian, uh, Austrian pathologist in the 19th century, that described this process. So what do you have to do? You injure the vascular endothelial cells. We're going to talk about a disease called hardening of the arteries. You destroy the intima, and that will promote thrombus formation. This becomes important in the brain because it can lead to an infarct or stroke. If it occurs in the heart, what do we call that? A heart attack. If we have it in the peripheral vessels, we'll get a gangrenous foot as a consequence of the lack of blood supply. The second is laminar flow, or you have increased viscosity, where you have too many red blood cells. We get what are called polycythemia. Or how many people have taken a long airliner trip, like 11 hours? What do they always tell you to do every hour? Why? Because one of the things that promotes thrombosis in the veins is stasis of blood. You notice I'm always moving, because I always tell students I don't want to become a 
embolus in the deep leg veins and it goes to my lungs and then I will collapse in front of you. That's why I'm constantly moving. Because when you move your muscles, what propels your blood back to your heart is muscle movement. That's why they want you to walk around. So stasis of blood. Where on this campus, would the people in this campus right now tonight would have the most likelihood of getting deep leg vein thrombosis? The patients. What are the patients doing right now? Where are they? Lying down, not moving. It's the patients. The doctor and nurse are moving. Don't worry about that. It's the patients. So this is something you have to realize. Or if you think of what occupations promote thrombus formation. How about truck drivers? What are they doing for hours on end? So it's always important to move around because you need that blood to circulate. So you have to think of various situations that are going to promote the stasis of blood. Aneurysms means dilation of the vessel walls because there's structural weakness, like in the aorta. I'll show you some examples. Hypercoagulability, you have too many platelets, too many clotting factors. What's a common drug that can increase the synthesis of clotting factors from your liver is birth control pills. Because the estrogen in birth control pills or estrogen in general will increase the synthesis of clotting factors in the hepatocytes. What do they tell women not to do when you take oral contraceptives? Is not to smoke. Because people don't realize that when you smoke, you have 4,000 organic waste products entering the intravascular space. What cells are going to be damaged are endothelial cells. That's going to promote thrombus formation. Plus, you have hypercoagulability state because you're synthesizing more clotting factors. So you should not be smoking and taking oral contraceptives. They can get thrombosis. So it's important to realize, knowing these risk factors, what you can do to prevent it. So this is a diagram that I've created. This is what is called rheology. Rheology is the study of, does anybody know what rheology is? R-H-E-O-L-O-G-Y. It's a study of fluid mechanics, in this case, blood. When you look at blood flow, how many people have played with a garden hose? Good, this will be perfect. When you take fluid that's going down a tube, where's the highest velocity? In the center. As you get closer to the edge, remember that those molecules in that fluid is hitting against and causing drag. So therefore, its velocities decrease. Every time you go down a freeway, like 280, where's the fastest traffic? On the side or in the center? In the middle, in the center. And as you get off, to the, get off the exit, what happens to the flow of traffic? It decreases. So next time you're over an overpass, you're looking at the intervascular space as blood is moving through it. And then if you have an accident, what happens to it? Turbulence occurs, and then you can get a thrombus. And that's what's going to cause it. And blood flow or traffic flow is a diminished. You'll see. So this is called laminar flow. So velocity. When you kink that hose, what did you notice? When you kink that hose, when you're playing with it, did you hear anything? Did you, when you kinked it, did you hear anything? What were you hearing? Turbulence, because you destroyed what? The laminar flow. Where do we use this clinically? When they take, has anybody ever taken blood pressure? What are you doing when you take, put on a blood pressure cuff? What are you doing? You're compressing an artery. And then you take it to a pressure and release the pressure. What are you listening to? Turbulence, because you've disturbed the laminar flow. And then when the turbulence goes away, that's the systolic, the first one. And the last is the diastolic. So you're playing with your garden hose when you take someone's blood pressure. It's the same analogy. OK? So laminar flow, you get, become a plumber when you're dealing with the cardiovascular system. So here are the risk factors for thrombosis. It's endothelial damage, abnormal blood flow, stasis, and hypercoagulability. What does a thrombus look like? Description, what shape is it? How do you describe a thrombus to somebody who's never seen it? What's its shape? Go back to elementary school. 
go back to elementary school. I've gone through, I have three children, and I've gone through these different shapes, volumes. It's cylindrical. Remember that term cylindrical? Remember elementary school. Bring it back. It's good stuff. It's cylindrical because where is it occurring? In a tube, which is cylindrical. And it's forming it. Is this a big one or a small one? Well, what do you have here to tell you? A ruler. Okay? So this one is about 8 centimeters, 2.4 centimeters per inch. So it's at least 3 inches. And it's about an inch wide. And you notice you see two colors, red, and you see red and white lines. These lines are called lines of zon. And so this came from a deep leg vein thrombosis. This is what it looks like fresh. Okay? When you look at it histologically, here is fi the pink represents protein, in this case fibrin, and platelets. And then these dark cells are your white blood cells. And here you see the mortar. And what's on each side of it? A layer of bricks, red. And that's how you can tell that that is a thrombus and not a blood clot, because I will show you the difference between a real blood clot and a thrombus and why they should not be used in that way. Ah, what am I looking at here, you might ask. When you do an autopsy, we take out everything from the mouth, typically, to the anus in one block. It's called an in-mass block dissection. What's the most posterior structure that runs down your vertebral bodies? is your aorta. So I'm going to show you the aorta and I'm, we open the aorta like a tube posteriorly. So when I'm looking at somebody walking down the street, I'm always visualizing their aorta. <laughs> I'm looking past the clothing and the external anatomy and thinking of how that aorta is running along your spine. And then it branches down the common iliacs down to your legs. And then the arch obviously is going to the left. So when we open up the aorta, the right is the right, and the left is the left. So to give you orientation, this patient looks like this. So what's there? The head to the north and to the south is the legs. How do I know this? This is gross anatomy. Here we see right here is where the diaphragm would be, and this is the abdominal aorta. What are these two organs coming off? That's the right kidney, and here's the left kidney. Okay? The common iliacs are down here. And what you see is, instead of being a tube that's going straight, we notice it's bulging out. This is an aneurysm, an abdominal aneurysm. And what you notice in an abdominal aneurysm, there's clotting of blood, like layers. You can see this here. This is a thrombosed aneurysm. Why are aneurysms most common in the abdominal aorta? because you have a bifurcation. What happens to turbulence? What happens to laminar flow when you get to a bifurcation, do you think? You cause eddy currents, and they're going around and around, and you've got turbulence all the time. And it's beating against that biological structure, the aorta, and it will degenerate as a function of time. And now it's structurally weaker, and it balloons out. Well, if it stretches and stretches, what's going to happen? What happens to a balloon if you stretch it? pops and what's going to happen? All the blood goes out and we've got a problem. Okay? And the most common disease to occur at this place is we're going to see is atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. And there it is. You got to love technology. Everything pops up. So, what's the evolution of a thrombus in a story? One, it can enlarge, get bigger and bigger, prevent blood flow, leading to hypoxic damage and leading to an infarct. And we call the lines of zon when you think of a brick wall. It can break off, and if it travels to a distant site, what do we call that? An embolus. This is important to realize. Because the hemostasis mechanism, when you form a hemostatic plug, what's the first thing you want to start to control is its size. So the hemostatic plug, when you have small thrombi, will take care of it naturally. But if they're too big, then it's going to be a problem because it takes too long. And what happens is when they go, they form as a thrombus or they go as an embolus like to the lungs, what's going to happen is they become organized. You get tissue repair, cells, macrophages, and other cells will start to break it down and try to reconstitute blood flow through that vessel that has that thrombus or embolus. We call this organization, tissue repair, or recanalization. The term means 
reestablishing vascular channels through that obstruction. And that takes time. So here's a diagram to illustrate deep leg vein thrombosis. Here you have this thrombus. You're moving around because the legs are contracting. Now it breaks off. Where can it go to? It can go to your lungs. So what would happen if I obstruct the pulmonary artery? What would the patient complain about acutely? Shortness of breath. What would the heart do in response to this physiologically to adapt to this increased heart rate because the amount of blood flow is decreased because it has because you have less oxygenation it's going to increase cardiac demand so what will the patient feel racing heart or palpitations and since the blood flow is important to going back to the coronary circulation during diastolic filling you can get chest pain acute onset either in the angio pectoris or you could get a infarct or chest pain in the lung as well as a consequence. Or the deep leg vein thrombosis, when we use the word re resolution, is completely broken down and nothing you see or feel clinically. Or it becomes organized, it becomes re endothelized and incorporated in the wall. You don't feel this, it all goes on and you don't know it. Or you try to establish new blood vessels, we call this recanalization. Okay? So what's the difference between a thrombus and a blood clot, as I promised? A thrombus only occurs when you're alive in the intravascular space, whether it's in the chambers of your heart or your blood vessels. So when does the blood clot, what happens to the blood flow when you're dead? Doesn't go. So what happens? This is called post-mortem clot. And it has a unique presentation. You don't have the lines of Zahn and these other things. It just settles out. The white blood cells are heavier in mass. They're going to have the white on the bottom and then the red blood cells at the top. Okay? When you have blood that's outside, when you're alive, outside the intravascular space, when it clots, what do we call that? A hematoma. How many people have had a bloody nose and you blow into the handkerchief or Kleenex and you, what do you see in your handkerchief? Blood. So that is a blood clot. It has no form to it. It's just a red mass. It looks like jelly, right? Red jelly. And so that would, and if it occurs in the brain, we call it a subdural hematoma. If it occurs in the abdominal cavity, a hematoma or in a tissue space. So blood clots do not have the lines of Zahn and it contains no platelets because it's outside the intravascular space versus the lines of Zahn that's formed like a brick wall. So, does that look like a thrombus? What do we call it? A blood clot. Is it cylindrical? It has no shape. No lines of Zahn. So it's important when we use the term blood clot that's occurring extravascular space versus when it occurs in the intravascular space when you're alive, we call it what? A thrombus. Very good. And if it travels? An embolus. See? It's vocabulary part of the story. So what is the biggest problem that we have to worry about is going to our lungs. And why is this important? Obviously because it's the most misdiagnosed disease in a hospital patient. Because it's silent until it, it, the, it forms the deep leg veins. You don't feel it because you have all this collateral circulation that's getting back. But when it breaks off and goes to the lung, then it reveals itself. So the most common places are deep leg veins, but in males you have to worry about the venous plexus around, there's veins around your prostate. Are women off the hook? No. There's a large venous plexus around the uterus, and these can be sites where you can get veins that are more compliant, you can get thrombus, and they can go but <clears throat> to the lungs. The most common place is the deep leg veins, because they have much greater volume compared to the superficial leg veins. What's the outcome? 70 80% of the time, you don't feel anything because your hemostatic mechanism to break it down takes care of it. So what can happen? Go to the lungs, cause localized area of lung to die. We call that an infarct. If you have small emboli going to the lungs, it's going to get organized. What happens to the compliance? It decreases. What happens to the peripheral resistance? It goes up in the lung pulmonary arteries. So what happens to the pressure? Goes up. And what side of the heart has to work harder now? 
You got two choices. <laughs> like on an exam. Is it the right or the left? The right. So then the heart, right heart will fail as a consequence of that. Okay? Or if it's so sudden, it can lead to death because you won't have no blood flow going to the left side of the heart. What happens to stroke volume? It goes down, your blood pressure drops, and all your organs will now succumb to the lack of oxygen. So this is what it looks like. Here's, we have different terms. This is a pulmonary embolus. It reminds it like going down a fork road, like sitting on a horse. What do we call that? A saddle embolus. It's going down the bifurcation. Okay? And I happen to have one to show you. First, I have to show you a normal lump. These are all real. These are gifts for people who have died at UCSF to help you understand what's going on. Okay? When we cut the lung, we cut the lung parasagially in this direction. So when I'm holding this up, this is the apex of the lung. If you go behind your clavicle and went straight down, you would hit the top of your lung. This is the apex of the lung here, and here we see the base of the lung. What's at the, what organ is, or what tissue is underneath the lung is your diaphragm. It contracts, it goes down, it expands the lungs. This is what your lung looks like. In cross section, the blue is lint, so that does not count. <laughs> the black right here is a lymph node, and it turns black because of air pollution. Your macrophage in your lungs will gobble up the pigment and then travel. So if you smoke, it becomes even more pronounced. Here we have the, basically the airways that has cartilage in it, as you can see here. And then here is a pulmonary artery. So this is normal. So what happens if you have a pulmonary embolus? Here's another lung. you notice here is the bronchus, and here we see a large pulmonary embolus inside the pulmonary that killed this patient. It had completely obstructed the blood flow to the right lung, because the right lung is on this side, and so this is the lower lobe, upper lobe, and middle lobe here, okay? If we turn it and looking on the inside of the lung, we can see the problem very obvious. That you can see here are the airways, and then you can see the, the pulmonary artery is completely occluded by a embolus. What does that embolus look like? Here, it's what shape? Cylindrical. See, third grade, good stuff. Those three-dimensional pyramids and polygons and everything else, diamonds. So this is what it looks like coming out of these vessels, okay? At the end, if you want to come up and feel these, you're more than welcome to. I got gloves. This is better than the Discovery Channel. Okay? Look at back. This is what happens in somebody who has, this is where the heart has been removed at autopsy, and what we're looking at here is the right pulmonary artery that's completely occluded by a embolus, and here's the left pulmonary artery. So there was no blood going to both the left and right lungs, and therefore no blood was going to the left ventricle. So the blood pressure dropped and the patient died within minutes. Okay? Let's go and look at the aorta as we look at atherosclerosis, hardening of the artery. So this is the normal histology. You can see that blood vessels have on the outside, because they're not in a body cavity, have a loose connective tissue, the adventitia, that contains blood vessels and nerves. The autonomic nervous system is important to control the vasoconstriction. The aorta is primarily made of the media. It has elastic fibers, and you notice these nuclei look like fish. When I see on uh, an aquarium, or you see in these uh, National Geographics under the water, you see all the fish going in the same direction. You notice the nuclei are all pointing in the same direction. These are smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts because of elastic fibers going in the same direction. Then what's on the surface is the intima, and on this, the single layer of cells that you see are the endothelial cells that become critical in hemostasis. So this is what we call elastic artery, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And here you see at the media, and then there's the intima, and then here's the lumen to the blood vessel out here, and here is that flat cell called the endothelial cell. Okay? Now, 
what happens over decades to your vessels, they're constantly being bombarded each 60 seconds by a heartbeat. All that kinetic energy is being released on this organ system. What can happen as a function of time, your blood vessels will start to break down, just like any biological tissue. And so this is what we call a chronic condition. We call this an umbrella term called arterial sclerosis. Does anybody know what sclerosis means? Fibrosis, and if you have all this connective tissue, it makes it less compliant, it means it's hard. So if the compliance of the vessel becomes hard, what happens to the pressure? It goes up. So one of the things that happens to everyone in this room, even pathologists, is that over a period of time, your blood pressure starts to go up both systolic and diastolic because your arterials become thickened as a function of aging so that when you take your blood pressure, both the systolic and diastolic are going up because it's less compliant. Remember the four variables, pressure, volume, contractility, and compliance. So as your vessels become harder arterials, it means the pressure will have to go up because it's less compliant. There are several conditions. One that affects only the arterials, it's due to hypertension. By the way, what's the, di what's the definition of hypertension? because doctors make this diagnosis all the time, and then you ask the patient, they go home to their family and say, what is hypertension? I don't know. They gave me a number. I don't remember the number. What is hypertension? How do you define it? Okay, what's, I'll, I'll make it real simple. Those in medical school, the medical students and dental students will always tell me, 140 millimeters of mercury systolic greater than 140, or a diastolic greater than 90. You tell that to a patient, how many people will be able to come home and remember that and tell it to their family? None. And they don't know why they're taking that medication. So what's a better definition, I tell students? It's an elevated blood pressure that leads to end organ damage. Now, will you remember that? Pressure is evil when it's too high to the intravascular space and it causes problems. And we'll look at this problems when we talk about it, what it does to the heart next time and to the vessels. But one of the things that's going to promote is arterial sclerosis. Diabetes. What does diabetes mean? Diabetes mellitus. It means sweetened with honey. In this case, the molecule is too much glucose. It causes cell injury, having too much sugar. And then simply aging, as we talked about, using biological structures. We're going to talk about atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, that involves the intima, but it only involves the muscular and elastic arteries, from the aorta down to the muscular arteries. There's another disease called Muckyberg's that affects the media. It clinically doesn't have a problem. It just makes the muscular walls uh, less compliant, and it becomes sclerotic or hard. So let's talk about atherosclerosis. What age do you tend to get this? What's old? Tell me what old is. <laughs> 80. Good. I had a student one time, and I used the word elderly. And she said, is elderly 40? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think I am? You're going to get there soon. <laughs> soon enough. So I always ask the person, when people ask, you always ask the person, what do you mean by old or elderly? As you get older, that number goes farther and farther away. You'll see even as high school students. So what sex tends to get it? More males than females. And we'll see with the risk factors. What are the primary risk factors that's going to cause damage to your arteries? Because we want to know the etiology cause. One is too much sugar in the blood. It damages those endothelial cells because it, those cells will break it down into polyalcohols and cause cellular damage and accelerate hardening the arteries. What's another thing? Too much lipid. Having too much cholesterol will accelerate because that lipid is going to get and hit against those endothelial cells. It accumulates and causes damage. Lipid is, breaks down to various components and can cause damage. What are things? Hypertension, no surprise, because that barrel trauma, kinetic energy, when it's high, will damage the endothelium or intima and accelerate it. What's another one? Being, living in a cesspool of a smoker. 
because those endothelial cells have to deal with a cesspool of cyanide, formaldehyde, carbon monoxide, 70, 68 known carcinogens, benzene. It's an organic chemistry that goes awry inside the intravascular space, okay? And that includes the people that get it from passive smoking too. And what's not, what's the new one on the block? that's becoming prevalent in the United States and around the world is obesity. Because if you have more tissue, what happens to your blood volume? Goes up. And therefore, it's going to cause more, you lead to hypertension, metabolic syndrome, diabetes. And if you smoke, have hypertension, diabetic, hyperlipidemia, your life expectancy is cut in half. For example, in England right now, 60% of the adult population in England is obese today. In the United States and adults, it's roughly 33%. By the year 2030, the CDC estimates it'll be up to 42%. One quarter of children in the United States are no obese. We're seeing diabetes in five-year-olds. It's a problem. You ever see the movie Wally? -E? What happened to the people on Earth? <laughs> what happened to them? They all became obese, and where would they be able to live? Not on Earth but where there's no gravity. So, even in Disney movies, you can see the foretelling of disease. It's how you look at it. What are other secondary risk factors? What should you be doing when you're a high school student? Or you're 90 years old, doesn't matter what age you are, is the exercise. So when you're studying for exams, you exercise that day. What happens when you worry about grades? What happens to your blood pressure? Goes up. You gotta go mellow into the exam or through life because you don't want your blood pressure to go up. There's a amino acid that's been shown that when it's elevated in people, it increases the likelihood of causing damage to the intima is homocysteine. So they clinically will ev evaluate if people have this. Ah, this is a plug for flossing your teeth. Because what's a conduit to the intravascular space is your oral cavity, because it's highly vascularized. 30 to 35% of your cardiac output goes to your head alone. If you think of the carotid arteries, the vertebral arteries going into your head. So bacteria have been found to get transiently into the bloodstream when you have poor oral hygiene and can cause damage to the intima and lead to atherosclerosis. Increasing age, so exercising, eating right, all these things, and getting a good night's sleep and being mellow in age, like wine, you mellow out, less aggressive. And this, let's say you have a patient who has no these risk factors, and they still have atherosclerosis. If you eat pizza three times a day for 30 years, you'll be guaranteed atherosclerosis. If you eat meat at every meal for 30 years, you will get atherosclerosis. So what you eat is what you became or will become, and so it's important because of all the lipid content. So what's the story when we talk about this in the pathogenesis? And it starts as a chronic condition. There's an important cell called the macrophage, and they accumulate in the intima. Then what happens is a function of time. There's lipid accumulating, and it degenerates. As a function of time, it becomes a plaque or atheroma. At this point, it's reversible. What's the unit of time it takes to develop this? What's the unit of time? Hours? Seconds? Decades. So is it preventable? Yes, starting now. OK? and what you've been doing for those that are older in the audience, like myself. And then as a function of time, it can degenerate, become calcified, rigid, weaken the structural integrity, and it can now break apart, and what could form on its surface? A thrombus, occluding it and leading to an infarct. In the brain, it's called a stroke. In the heart, a heart attack. In the legs, deep leg vein, uh, basically gangrenous feet. And it becomes clinically evident when it's too late. That's the whole point. And this is just showing this process in diagrammatic form as a function of time. Macrophages come in, 
Smilitza cells come from the media because of cytokines, molecules that crosstalk between these cells. They accumulate. What happens to the lumen? It becomes smaller and smaller, decreased blood flow. Do you feel this? No, it's silent. You only feel it when you increase the cardiac demand and you can't meet it because it's occluding it. Here's another diagram that's showing this process over decades and then it becomes calcified, it can rupture, you bleed, it can dilate, it can produce a thrombus in the heart, it would lead to a heart attack or in the brain an infarct or it becomes so stenotic, there's a lack of blood flow, you get atrophy in the tissue and then if you have increased demand like in the heart, you could have a, a a lethal heart attack with any increased cardiac demand. This is what the aorta looks like. If you look at this, this is the diaphragm, so the uh, thoracic aorta is above. This is the celiac trunk going to your liver and stomach. This is the superior mesenteric artery that's going to your intestines. There's your right renal artery, and that's fatty streaks, and you don't feel this accumulation of lipid occurring. <coughs> What happens is lipid and smooth muscle cells accumulate to raise a plaque above this. This is a special stain, oil red O of the intima. See all that red that normally shouldn't be there that represents lipid? And what do you notice about this aorta? Looks like an old rusty pipe. It's been there for decades and that's exactly what happens. And so when you look at this, you can see that's where the diaphragm is. There is a fatty streak an atheroma that's sticking above a plaque and then it ulcerates and breaks down and it's irreversible at this point. And there are people walking around that have aortas look just like this right now. So everybody worries about what you look like on the outside. I'd be more concerned about what you look like on the inside because that's what makes the rest look good. This is what it looks like microscopically. This is the plaque. This is the lumen on the outside and you get this grudge or gruel, that's what atheroma means, and it's basically acellular, and then this is the interface between the media, which is now structurally weakened, and then the adventitia. Now what can happen is, remember the laminar flow, it's like a chisel, it'll hit that plaque and then it can go underneath of it and dissect and rip your aorta, and then rupture or produce an aneurysm or break off and become embolic. And this is what it looks like in an atherosclerotic plaque. You see no nuclei, there's no cells, it's just cholesterol and grunge. And you can't get rid of it. Well, you can, the surgeons, like in the carotid arteries, they call it endarterectomy, rotor-rooter time, to take care of it. And then this is the interface between the media. This elastic stain, there's the plaque, and then inside the plaque, and then you see the elastic fibers are in black. This is just to show you the base of the plaque on the media, and this is a, a, the normal stain. We can see these is H&E, hematoxin, eosin, and there's the plaque. It's just grunge, and you see it on the elastic stain, and then you see the elastic fibers. What do you notice about the elastic fibers here? They're missing. So what happens to the structural integrity? It's diminished and becomes less compliant and rigid as a function of time. What happens to organs coming off? So what side of the body is this? It's real simple. Pathologists, the right is the right and the left is the left. Radiologists, they switch it. That's why they charge more than the pathologists. <laughs> Haven't you noticed that when you see the bill? What do you notice about this kidney on this side? It's atrophy because over time, those vessels coming at the aorta have occluded blood that goes through and shrinks down. But what does this kidney have to become? hypertrophied because it has to take over the function of that left kidney that's been destroyed because of chronic lack of blood flow. This is the aorta with atherosclerotic plaque. There is the celiac trunk, I mean the superior mesenteric and the renal arteries and what's forming on the, on the surface is a thrombus and that can break off and go to your legs and lead to gangrenous foot. Oh, what has happened here? This is not somebody with a beer belly with legs, looks like cowboy boots down here. This is the aorta with an aneurysm. And these are aneurysms of the common iliacs that's occurring. And people don't feel this as a function of time. And then atherosclerosis, one of the four vascular beds that I leave with you is the cerebral vessels. The most common disease involving your cerebral vessels to your brain is atherosclerosis. 
The most common cause of death in the United States is ischemic heart disease due to coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis. The most common disease involving your aorta is atherosclerosis leading to aneurysms with or without rupture and can lead to renal failure because of the organs coming off that can be occluded by that stenosis and it can break off. You ever turn on an old house, the faucet and all this brown gunk comes out? This occurs in people too. It can go to your brain from your aorta if it's off the ascending aorta or down to your kidney and other organs. And then last but not least, peripheral vascular disease. What do they look like? This is the brain showing you atherosclerotic plaques in the basal artery and this is an aneurysm because it weakens it and that can burst in the subarachnoid space and lead to acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here's the coronary artery in the heart. You're looking at the circumflex coronary artery. There's the yellow atherosclerotic plaque and this right here is what's left of the lumen to supply the heart muscle. This is in the aorta, this is the kidney here at glomeruline tubules and what do we see? This renal artery is occluded with cholesterol clefts as a reflection of the breaking off and traveling. And this is the consequence to your lower extremities. This is gangrene and this is what is gangrene. What color is it by the way? Black. Why is it black, do you think? Oh, that's the circular argument. I know it's dead, but why does it turn that color? No, no, smoking it does that to the lungs, it turns it black. <laughs> this is not the lung. The anatomy is the wrong part. And black is a, a different reason. This is going back to chemistry and biology that you learn in high school. When tissue does not get oxygen, what, what type of biochemical pathway is used for cells? You have, what's the energy currency called in the cell? ATP. What biochemical system generates ATP? Oxidative phosphorylation and the Krebs cycle. And you need oxygen to take care of this process. So if you can't use aerobic metabolism, you switch to anaerobic. And what do you produce a lot of? Lactic acid. So what happens to the pH in that tissue? The pH drops. Because you have an acid environment, what's the metal that's bound to the mitochondria in the, the uh, cytochrome C is iron. The hemoglobin in the red blood cells has iron in it. You have iron in the myoglobin, in the muscle, in cells. So if you put organically bound iron in acid, what color do you think it turns to? Black. So it's chemistry that can explain why it's black and if you're a physician you know it's dead not just because it's a different color but the color is a key to the pathogenesis. In this case it's been gone through a process of death. So what have we covered tonight in summary? First we've talked about the role of the pathologist, we talked about problems of the intravascular highway in terms of fluid getting too much, edema, congestion, hemostasis. A thrombus only occurs when, where and when? In the intravascular space when you are alive and when it travels and embolus and what's the most common disease to involve your arteries? Atherosclerosis. On that note, thank you very much. <laughs>